uh, welcome to my lecture on Core Linux architecture. And uh, essentially, I, th this is going to be an awesome lecture. Uh, it's it's gonna we're gonna go down the rabbit hole, but from from a little bit of a high level. Uh, so uh, any, anyhow, it's uh, basically we're going to be looking at the Core Linux architecture, right? Um, essentially, the the Linux stack, and also we're really going to be diving into security concepts of the kernel. Um, it's this lecture is going to be super awesome because. I mean, things that you kind of hear about every day in the wild, like buffer overflows and stuff like that. Well, we're going to go ahead and learn about kind of the, the memory uh, architecture behind that, right? And and how, you know, kind of understanding from a foundational level um, how those types of attacks, um, you know, are basically can, can be carried out. Um, I'm not specifically going into buffer overflows in this lecture, but I'm kind of giving the foundation uh, for that. Um, and I will speak speak about that really heavily uh, in a, in a follow-up lecture. But anyhow, I'm super stoked because we're, we're pretty much, we're, we're getting a, a very solid foundation uh, for our understanding uh, of Linux, which is obviously very important. And we're just going to be looking at different, uh, also just hyper-focusing on security, basically implications of the kernel uh, and, and how really, you know, kind of uh, the kernel really deals with privileges and, 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 and etc. So this is going to be super awesome. Um, obviously, this is from a very high level. So, you know, um, you know, it's just kind of something to keep in mind. But we're going to kind of start here. And then in subsequent le lectures, we're going to uh, keep going further and further down. So let's let's roll. <laughs> all right. So all right, let's do this. So why should you really care about this um, from a security perspective, just Linux architecture in general, right? So about, you know, 98.3% uh, right, of Alexa's top 1 million web servers use Linux. So, you know, as this is a very popular platform, which makes sense, right, for a lot of businesses, because it's, you know, I mean, except for certain distros in Red Hat and things like that, I mean, you could, you know, roll a, a Linux distro and put it on a, a, you know, trillion servers and it, you know, pretty much just be absolutely free. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's something really that is going to continue to be a, a have a huge market share. So um, this, essentially this slide, uh, the Linux architecture slide, uh, I, I found this on IBM.com, really informative. Uh, essentially, we're going to be looking at all these different spaces today. You kind of see like the user space, kernel space, kind of how, you know, the Linux is comprised of both of these spaces. Uh, but, you know, let's just go ahead and kind of sit and you know, start on essentially what everything sits on, right? And that's the hardware platform. So, yeah, let's, uh, let's start that up. So, lowest level, right? We have the CPU, we have memory, um, which is known, you know, as RAM. So, I mean, usually every day, I mean, there's all, there's different types of memory other than RAM. But essentially, you know, for everyday purposes, when you hear people talk about memory, they're usually referring to RAM. Okay, so we have that, we have this, and then we also have network ports. So, let's keep rolling. Obviously, RAM is vital, and as we'll see, uh, it's essentially what um, you know houses this software called the kernel, right? Uh, that we're <laughs> we that a lot of us are, are kind of scared of. Hey, I mean, at one point in my life, uh, that just that name was very intimidating to me. But as we progress throughout these lectures, you'll see it's not as as intimidating as uh, one might think. So okay, so RAM is vital, right? So and it's base essentially you can think of you know RAM as a high speed storage area for a bunch of bits, right? Zeros and ones, because at the end of the day, that's all we're really dealing with. And here's another kind of an interesting thing. You always you know hear you know either developers or other people in IT or you know or and so forth or just in the industry talk about state, right? Um, usually they're referring to application state, uh, but essentially you can just think of state as just a unique combination of these bits, right, that are held in RAM. And hacker logic, why is it called RAM? So here's one thing I, I just really want to say. I mean, hackers from an old school perspective essentially has nothing to do with breaking into computers or, you know, I mean, doing some kind of mischief or anything like that. That's just kind of popularized in the media. Uh, essentially, to me, what a hacker is, is just an incredibly inquisitive person and tries to think outside the box in ways that, you know, if something is being utilized in one way, you know, if something is made to, to, you know, fulfill a certain purpose, you know, the hacker thinks, oh, well, I wonder if I can tweak it to perform something else outside of its, you know, intended function. Uh, you're just inquisitive. So going on that, I mean, 
so why is it called RAM? Okay, I know this isn't a lecture on RAM, but I, I just, but I think it's something to be, you know, going off that hacker logic. It's questioning everything, right? And let's just go into that. Hackers question everything and want to know how things work, right? And it's very easy to speak about RAM, right? Or really anything else, especially in this industry, um, without act fully knowing what it is. And what I mean by that is there's so many terms out there. There's so much stuff to know. It's easy to kind of drop like, oh, you know, I have this much RAM on my computer and not fully know what it's like or, or what it means. I mean, I, I've been guilty of this at, at times. You know, I think we all are and I probably in the, in the future will as well. But the important thing is, is to just to really understand is when you catch yourself doing that to remember, you know, I mean, hey, you know, it's let's 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 stop what we're doing and let's dive in and let's be inquisitive about kind of what, you know, what it really means. So anyhow, what RAM really means is it's RAM is RAM or random access memory is a form of memory that can be accessed uh, without scanning the previous bits in memory. So, so basically non-sequential access. Okay. So this, this makes RAM so fast, right? Relative to traditional hard drives, you know, um, CD-ROMs, etc. Um, basically, you know, these types of devices had read-write speeds that are essentially predicated on arm movement delays, right, and disk rotation speeds. So, you know, I mean, if you ever opened up one of those old-school hard drives, you know, um, you know, you see a physical arm in there, right? Um, so that's going to be delivering sequential access. So RAM uh, is not that. So you know, and RAM is vital, right? And and it's where the kernel and running processes reside, right? So applications, daemons, etc. And a peripheral device's um, input-output flows through RAM. So let's look at the let's look at the CPU. And the CPU, as we are going to learn about today, is is very important um, in in security and essentially um, running uh, essentially privileges on code and what that code can uh, essentially what it can. Um, access throughout the system. Uh, so the CPU is put into different modes that allow for different access. And we're going to be going into that and foreshadowing here a little bit. Um, but anyhow, we can just, CPU, I'm just saying, is very important for security um, perspective, uh, for, sec for security concepts. And let's start here at the foundation. So basically, a CPU is just an operator on memory, right? And abstract, all this stuff is super abstract because um, it would take me 20 years to go over this if it was not uh, super abstract. But CPU from an abstract perspective is it really reads its the CPU reads its instructions from data. Um, it, whoops, sorry, let me rephrase that. So CPU, right? So it reads its instructions and data from RAM. Okay, does a transformation on that data. Okay, and then it pushes that result back to RAM. So let's get to the the let's get to the good the good stuff right so um that all that other stuff was good as well but um so let's go into the kernel space and we're really not going to be speaking highly about the architecture dependent kernel code kind of this layer of the kernel what's really important to know about this is that the linux kernel um can be con can, can be compiled or is compiled for different processor architectures. We're going to be actually going a little bit into processor architectures, x86, ARM, but it's going to be very light. I'm just kind of just talking about one versus the other. But um, essentially, you can know that there's different compilate or the kernel is compiled for different architectures. Okay, so we're going to be looking at uh, essentially the kernel and the system call interface. So let's start it up. So kernel, what is the kernel? Okay, it's the core of Linux. Okay, it's software that is held in RAM. Um, it manages the hardware and it instructs the CPU. And really, you can think of the kernel as just a middleman, right, between the hardware and a running process, right? And a process is a program, right? So the kernel really deals with process management, memory management, device drivers, system calls, etc. Obviously, all this stuff I've been talked about, you're like, whoa, what's this? Um, but um, I'm just foreshadowing a little bit here. But uh, we're going to be going, like, hyper-focusing on these areas today, all these all these things in the last bullet point. Um, but before we get to that, right, there's a couple of just key terms that we need to understand. Okay, important terms. What's the kernel space? And you actually saw that on the previous... Um, on the previous picture, uh, that, that Linux architecture picture, the, the kernel space pretty much encapsulated all the areas of the kernel in that picture. So essentially, the kernel space is the area in RAM that is 
reserved for the kernel. Okay? And it is sandboxed from the user space. And we're going to learn about what the user space is very, very soon. Okay? So user space. Um, well, you know what? I, actually, before I go on right here, just sandboxing in general. Okay? I just want to say that you know, sandboxing essentially is just an isolation of memory processes. Okay, um, so in RAM, sandboxing your, your your processes is really just making sure that each one of those uh, can't just access the private contents of another. Um, we're going to be going into this kind of this a virtual memory. Uh, a memory management scheme called virtual memory um, and, and kind of how you know you can kind of understand a, a foundation of this sandboxing and how it's implemented but I just want to say that um, essentially sandboxing is just very important for security and you know it I'm going to be hyper focusing on this in a sub in a basically subsequent lecture um, and its implications for buffer overflows right you're going to be hearing about buffer overflows a lot um, and that's actually yeah, yeah, that's that's all over the place. So anyhow, um, but right now we're just really learning the essentially the fundamentals. So let's go into the user space. So the user space is the area in RAM that is reserved for user processes. Okay, and what's a user process? So a user process is essentially it's a process you interact with as the user, right? The shell, the GUI. Um, these also can be servers, you know, that you instantiate, etc. Now, CPU execution modes, and this is something that I was kind of talking about a second ago, right? So we essentially, we have kernel mode and user mode. And kernel mode is basically the, C, uh, the CPU, when it's in this mode, can perform any instruction, and those instructions can access any portion of memory, okay? And uh, obviously, I mean, this, this is pretty uh, open-ended right here, right, uh, if the CPU is in kernel mode. So... This is really a particular target for hackers, and it gets around the sandboxing, right? And the sandboxing, as we saw, is just the, the, the segmentation, right, between the kernel space and the user space. Um, so, you know, I mean, hey, you know, hacker goes in, gets into, you know, kernel mode. Well, they, they you know, kind of uh, subvert <laughs> that, that whole sandboxing process and can pretty much access anything on the system. So that's a particular target. Um, and also, uh, additionally, um, kernel mode processes can easily crash the system. Um, they're a little more volatile, obviously, just because it has unrestricted access. And we can really think of kernel mode as, as the privilege mode, right? And also... Uh, sometimes you'll hear, I was, you know, kind of reading some documentation, kernel mode is kind of synonymous with system mode as well. So, CPU execution modes, right? So, we, we just went through kernel mode, let's check out user mode. So, user mode is essentially the CPU instructions are, are restricted, and those instructions can only access a small portion of memory. Okay, so the CPU instructions are uh, limited to safer operations and use for uh, user processes, right? So um, the CPU is going to be in this mode when user processes are executed. And here's a really important thing to, to know. Uh, all processes start in user mode, okay? And just as a kind of an aside, the kernel isn't a process. It's a controller of processes, right? So it's just, uh, yeah, kind of a, a, an interesting thing just to kind of put in, in, into your mind uh, when you're kind of defining what, what all these things are.